discuss today. And I'm also so grateful to our panelists, our presenters, and our moderator. Today, we're proud to present a year-long impact study of the 100,000 strong in the America's Innovation Fund, carried out by the Dialogue's Outstanding Education Program, led and guided by Ariel Fishbein. The study itself was co-authored by two superb professionals and team members, Anna Herrero and Sarah Stanton, who deserve to be commended and congratulated for their terrific effort. The 100,000 Innovation Fund is one of the largest public-private funds to support intra-regional academic exchange and mobility is a great example of exactly the type of hemispheric partnerships that the dialogue seeks to, seeks to promote. By connecting students and higher education institutions from the United States to the peers in Latin America and the Caribbean, 100,000 grants are planting a seed for an enduring network of future regional leaders in a variety of fields motivated by their desire to learn and to innovate. The study not only highlights the catalytic impact that the fund has on students, higher education institutions, and donor partners across the Western Hemisphere, it also identifies opportunities to scale it up. With the new U.S. administration, this report is extremely timely in reinforcing the importance of investing in initiatives like the 100,000 strong, which can have an enormously positive and long-term effect on hemispheric cooperation and dialogue. Let me review a bit uh, what today's agenda will look like. First, we'll hear opening remarks from Julie Chung, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs in the State Department. Then Anna and Sarah will present the key messages and recommendations from the impact study, which was just published this morning and is accessible on our website. After that, we will hear from our stellar panelists about their own experiences with the fund and their thoughts on the findings and recommendations presented in the study. The panelists include Alfonso Quinones, current ambassador of Guatemala to the United States. Paolo Enau, who's director of International Relations Office, ICITEC, a partner institution of the Innovation Fund, who is joining us from Bogota, Colombia. Aaron Gornick, the education advocate for Fox Valley Technical College in Wisconsin, an experienced grantee of the Innovation Fund. And John Pechowski, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs in the Department of State. We're also very thrilled and honored to have with us former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico, former Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, and Inter-American Dialogue member, Roberta Jacobson, who has kindly agreed to moderate this panel. And finally, we'll hear from John McPhail, who's the President and CEO of Partners of the Americas, who will wrap up the event with closing remarks. We want to thank Partners of the Americas and the Office of the Western Hemisphere Affairs and the State Department for their support of this impact study, as well as their collaboration in putting together this event and ensuring its success. In particular, Ukiah Bush and Penelope Kim at Partners and Maggie Hug at the State Department. We're so grateful to have them as partners and collaborators. Before turning it over to Julie, I just wanna let the participants know that you're welcome to use the Q&A function on the, on the Zoom panel, and our panelists will do the best they can to engage in conversation and respond to your, uh, to, to your questions and comments. So um, without further ado, um, let me turn it over uh, to Julie Chung. Julie? Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon for everybody. Thanks to your wonderful team, Michael, for the incredible collaboration over the many months on this new impact report on the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund. Everybody in my office knows every time we talk about the 100,000 Strong, I get really excited because I believe in the power of what this program and this fund does. And along with my team in the Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, I welcome everyone joining us virtually for this timely discussion, highlighting the impact of regional public-private sector partnerships and investments by the higher education community to expand innovative training and exchange programs. 
This is really a team effort across sectors to ensure that more students from diverse backgrounds gain the access to innovative, sustainable, academic and workforce development opportunities in the US and Latin America. What brings us together today is the collaboration between our bureau, our embassies and partners of the Americas working with visionary private and public sector leaders and higher education institutions throughout the hemisphere. The 100,000 Strong Innovation Fund is the department's signature regional initiative to champion the power of education, to transform societies, provide opportunity and stimulate economic prosperity. Thanks to a shared vision, teamwork and resilience over seven years, the 100K Fund has cultivated a network of engaged citizens supporting our goals to strengthen collaboration and transparency among governments, businesses, academic networks, all very critical to the economies uh, in the Americas. The 100K engagement is a widely recognized public-private sector collaboration, and it's a model that really works. From 2013 to 2020, the department's contributions of $7 million have been leveraged over $15 million from public, private, academic sectors, 65% are from non-US government sources to support the 100K fund grants and our policy goals. Now in those seven years, the 100K fund awarded over 250 grants to teams of 510 institutions in 25 countries and 49 US states from Vancouver to Tierra del Fuego, resulting in innovative, sustainable academic training and workforce development programs that have benefited over 10,000 students and counting. Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, Chile, Guatemala are the leading 100K strong grant recipient countries in partnership with US universities and college like my alma mater, the University of California, San Diego, which has programs in aeronautics and agro-industries. The Innovation Network has grown now to over 2,300 higher education institutions with 1,300 universities and colleges throughout the US. This regional network is a trusted one-stop shop for higher education teams to connect, to collaborate, and to create new training programs. And we really appreciate our colleagues at Partners of the Americas for their collaboration over these seven years to develop and expand our public-private partnerships and innovation fund programs. John, thanks to you and your amazing dedicated team. As the dialogue report shows, partnerships resulting from 100K strong grants create groundbreaking education exchanges for diverse students in the US and the region. Students from the US work in teams with students in Latin America to solve real world problems, conduct research, gain technical, linguistic, intercultural skills. This is all imperative for today's global economy and especially as we recover from the COVID pandemic. Also highlighted in this report is 100K strong partnership and exchanges that are diverse and inclusive. This speaks to the strategic commitments of our donor partners and higher education leaders to ensure equity and diversity and 100K strong programming. As documented in the report, the 100K fund has enabled students in the US and Latin America to advance, launch, or transform their academic and professional trajectories while planting the seeds for lasting collaborative networks across the hemisphere. This would not be possible without our partners from private and public sectors, of course along with higher education leaders throughout the US, Latin America and the Caribbean, who have been visionary in their commitments to create a better future and increase opportunity. On, the, on behalf of the department, we thank you and salute you. And in closing, I wanna recognize distinguished panelists joining the discussion today, especially Ambassador Alfonso Quinones of Guatemala, Paolo Henao from Colombia, and Aaron Gornick of Fox Valley Technical College in Wisconsin. Guatemala is the leading country in Central America for private sector commitments and 100K strong grant winning teams with the United States. Colombia is the leading country for regional public sector contributions and ISITEX has generously supported two sets of 100K strong fund competitions to increase partnerships and training with the US. 
Fox Valley Technical College is an impressive example of how U.S. community colleges can create inclusive training and academic exchange programs for students in Wisconsin and Latin America. I want to thank Roberta Jacobson for joining us today to moderate the panel discussion. Roberta, we really appreciate your early on visionary leadership and commitment to ensure the development of this resilient regional education initiative and partnership. Now on to the report presentation and panel discussions. And thank you to everybody participating today. Seguimos adelante. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julie. For, I'm really grateful for those excellent uh, remarks and, and, and really appreciate it. And thanks for getting us off to such a terrific start. Uh, and with that, it's, I'm very, very happy to turn it now to the co-authors of the report, uh, my colleagues at the Dialogue, uh, Ana Herrero and Sarah Stan. Thank you very much, Michael um, and Julie, for, for your kind words um, and your excellent remarks. Um, we're very pleased and grateful to have had the opportunity to evaluate such an impactful, um, robust, and strategic initiative, as Julie mentioned, for Western, Western Hemisphere relations. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, we will be focusing on the key messages that came out of this year-long impact study of the 100K Innovation Fund, uh, which, as Michael mentioned, was published today and you can access on our website. By engaging donors and partners from across the Americas, the 100K model focuses on building sustainable partnerships across higher education institutions that in turn will result in more educational exchange opportunities for all students. To align with the layered objectives of this model, our report was organized around three key levels of impact. For the first level, we define student development in terms of the impact of 100Q programs um, on both immediate skills development for students, as well as future trajectories and further opportunities for mobility. Under student impact, we also measure the effectiveness of the program in expanding access to study abroad opportunities and diversifying um, student cohorts. On the second level of impact, higher education institutional development and growth we define this both in terms of their internal development as an institution, be it through increased interdepartmental collaboration, increased leadership, or the procurement of an internal funds, as well as the development of external partnerships um, with other higher education institutions and the ability to sustain those. And finally, the study evaluates the impact that the fund had on its donors and partners um, by first assessing the motivations and goals behind their contributions and then charting them against the strategic benefits that they reported they have gained, um, as well as the impact they perceived that the fund had on their targeted um, beneficiaries. A really quick note on methodology. Um, we collected the data to inform this study across a five month period. Um, we disseminated two sets of, of surveys, excuse me, one for higher education institutions, both in English and in Spanish, one for donors, also both in English and in Spanish. Um, to complement this survey data, we also conducted four focus groups, um, two with students, one group from Latin America and the other from the US and two uh, higher education institution representative focus groups also from Latin America and the US. We finally conducted eight interviews um, with donor partners of the fund, four were with regional governmental donors and four with uh, private sector donors, which, are, which were a general representative of the typical industries that are featured in the Innovation Fund's donor pool. So we turn first to the impact the fund has on students. Um, although most 100K programs are typically short in nature, they undeniably have a very lasting catalytic effect on students. In particular, in our surveys and interviews, 100K students and their program leads reported three main areas in which the program catalyzed their personal and professional development. In first place, the majority of students interviewed in the study were able to form connections with other students and faculties in their host universities that definitely outlasted the programs themselves. Um, there were several examples of students engaged in scientific research uh, and collaborations that were later published jointly with faculty or students from their host university. Students believe that these connections, especially with faculty, would be extremely beneficial as they advanced um, in their professional and academic careers. 
In second place, given the practical focus of 100K funded programs, uh, many students found that the most valuable part of their experience was the ability to practice the skills that they learned in their classrooms and having the opportunity to then better understand the professional careers and professional options that were available to them. Some students even reported changing their majors actually upon returning to their home institutions to focus on a different speciality as, as the quote below reflects. Uh, and last but not least, 100K catalyzed student mobility much beyond their initial uh, programs. This was especially true for Latin American students um, whose confidence in their own academic skills and their understanding of financial aid opportunities for study abroad were very much strengthened by their participation in 100K programs. Um, U.S. students also gained um, a much more global perspective and some even decided to focus on their further studies on Latin American and Caribbean issues. This quote exemplifies kind of the ripple effect that we're talking about that this short term 100K funded programs can have on the larger student population um, that is beyond the initial student cohort. Of course, if they were able to be sustained across time. This quote came from one of our focus group from a chemical engineering student from Mexico. In terms of the one who gives models focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, which was already mentioned by um, both Julie and Michael, as you can see, 100K cohorts are very diverse, especially when defined by the inclusion of racial minorities, low income, and first generation students. Compared to the 2009 US national average for all students that studied abroad, 100K cohorts are much more inclusive of racial minorities. Additionally, and this stat is not represented in the graph, um, in each focus group, there were at least two or three students out of eight um, that had not traveled outside of their countries before participating in this program, both from the US and Latin America. And although 100K programs have overall been extremely successful in recruiting diverse student cohorts, we identified a couple of barriers that, that have the potential to be addressed that are perhaps limiting the institution's efforts to focus on DNI um, recruitment and selection targets. So US institutions on the one hand commonly found that their students were not as interested in the opportunity um, due to competing responsibilities, um, such as jobs, curricular constraints or demands, or because other regions drew more interest. Um, the small candidate pool hindered their ability to be strategic about their DNI focus in their selection. On the other hand, Latin American institutions, although they benefited from really high student interest, they often focused on English language ability, um, which often correlated with socioeconomic um, background as a key criteria for selection. And that to some extent compromised their DNI focus um, in those processes. Similarly, visa restrictions and eligibility also played a role um, in some institutions' selection process. Sarah will explain um, two recommendations in depth that stemmed from our study, which we think can help address um, all of these barriers. And now we're turning to our second level of impact, which is higher education institutions. 100K grants have served as a platform for winning teams of all sizes and institutions of all kinds to strengthen institutional capacity and also develop lasting partnerships. Internally, 100K grants have impacted institutional capacity in two key ways. Um, firstly, they have fostered institutional growth and leadership buy-in. For smaller Hayes in particular, the innovation grants have jump-started um, new study abroad procedures and program areas. And in some cases, 100K programs have become the first step towards establishing a dedicated study abroad office, um, which is pretty transformational. For a larger haze with a more established study abroad operation, 100K's reputation um, often helped secure dedicated internal funding that was not available before, and also leadership investment, especially to expand um, study abroad offer in Latin America and the Caribbean um, region. Secondly, given the collaborative nature of the 100K proposal writing process, which often involves several departments in both the home and host institutions, led to an increase in internal collaboration across offices and, and colleagues and departments. Um, this is illustrated, of course, by, by this quote by a Latin American institution representative. 
This quote showcases sort of the transformational effect we were talking about um, that the grain can have on smaller institutions and their um, internal capacity. It's of course, um, this came from a US community college representative who they initially earned two grants um, and then were able to continue on um, without the third cycle. Um, So beyond internal capacity, 100K grants have facilitated the development of new and lasting partnerships. Again, because the proposal writing is such a collaborative process, partner institutions are able to form very deep connections from the start. 70% um, of all surveyed Hayes for this study reported citing a memorandum of understanding with their partners um, that outlasted the grant. Secondly, the majority of, of winning Hay teams continue to collaborate on academic research projects and all of those also outlasted the grant. And although maintaining partnerships and research collaborations is extremely common amongst winning um, institutions, sustaining student level programming is more challenging um, after at least just one cycle of funds. This is especially true for smaller institutions who are unable to secure their own internal funds. And here again, Sarah will be able to offer a recommendation that we identified to address this particular challenge. And so lastly, before I turn it over to Sarah to outline the recommendations, I want to share a few points about the impact that the fund has had on donors and how much that impact aligned um, with their initial goals and motivations. So first of all, based on our survey and interviews, we identified three top motivations um, for donor partners to contribute to the innovation fund. First, it was an opportunity for thematic alignment that was crucial. Um, this is something that the fund offers whereby companies can define the themes of the green competitions that they sponsor. This was valued for by both private and governmental donors alike to be able to align competitions um, to the key topics in their industries and also national agendas. Secondly, donor partners were interested in the diversity and inclusion focus of the 100K model to expand mobility and partnership opportunities for students and institutions who would not otherwise have the opportunity to do so. Um, this is also exemplified by the quote here um, on, on the slide. And finally, specifically, public and governmental donors were very interested in externalizing the management of funds to a trusted and experienced third party, um, such as Partners of the Americas, um, to be able to overcome bureaucratic constraints that may have otherwise slowed down these processes. And based of the, on this, um, donors reported three key strategic benefits that they did gain from partnering with the fund. Number one was an increased access to academic sectors, both in the US and Latin American countries. Number two was especially for Latin, uh, Latin American donors, strengthening their bilateral relationships with the US um, government institutions, including US embassies and being associated with a well-known and recognized US government um, initiative, which was very strategic. And finally, but not less important, Donors emphasize that the fund had a very positive impact on the public discourse around hemispheric relationships. This was particularly important for transnational companies who worked across the region. And just to wrap up here, finally, although the strategic benefits of partnering with the fund were very important, um, all of donors, public and private, were most interested in the impact that the fund could have on their grantees um, or target beneficiaries. These two quotes illustrate the positive impact that governmental partners perceived that the fund had on, on their grantees. They also confirmed that the DNI focus um, of the 100K model um, became a goal that was, that was fulfilled um, very positively. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to go through some of our recommendations. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, thank you everyone for being here. So as Anna so clearly uh, showed in her presentation, um, 100,000 Strong in the Americas has been a really effective uh, program for promoting academic exchange in the Americas and for equipping young people with uh, the skills and knowledge that will allow them to really succeed um, in future professional endeavors. We talked about it a lot, and I think you've heard it in, in the comments today so far as sort of a catalyst um, for students and for higher education institutions as well. 
um, to be able to really move to that sort of next step in their growth. And so our recommendations today really seek to build upon the existing strengths of the program um, while also proposing new ways for it to expand its reach um, and, and even its ambitions into um, different areas. So in order to develop these recommendations, we've tried to really build upon and leverage what we see as two of the 100K program's key strengths. Um, and the first strength there is the strong reputation and brand name recognition that they have. Um, so that people know what it means to receive a 100,000 Strong in the Americas grant, and that's seen as something really positive. And then also um, that they, they're working with a really effective partnership model that brings together the State Department, Partners of the Americas, along with um, higher education institutions of all kinds from throughout the hemisphere and donor partners to really deliver significant impact um, and efficient use of, of those resources. So um, the first recommendation focuses on continuing to connect 100,000 Strong in the Americas with State Department programs in order to address um, barriers to student participation. Uh, 100,000 Strong, as you should be able to see with, with the great faces we have here today in our, in our panel and, and in our welcoming remarks, is a really integral and important part of State Department work. Um, and we believe that there's a potential to take even greater advantage of its strategic positioning within the Department of Western Hemisphere Affairs. So one thing that our research showed was that despite existing efforts, um, language skills and visa processing and travel issues, um, that, that latter category specifically for students from Latin American and Caribbean countries, can continue to be barriers um, in order to guarantee access to all students regardless of their background. Um, and so we see there's an opportunity there to link foreign language programs that the State Department offers um, or building out fellowships and professional development pipelines as optional add-ons to the 100,000 strong experience that's already offered. Um, and, and given, again, the other programming that the State Department has, as well as the hemispheric reach of the um, of Western Hemisphere Affairs, uh, we think that the State Department is really well positioned to integrate those efforts fully into 100,000 Strong. Um, now, the second recommendation uh, comes from the fact that during our research, and particularly in our focus group interviews with students, with students, we realize that there's currently not any complete unified database of student participants in 100,000 strong programs, because all of that information is managed at the institutional level by each student's higher education institution. Um, and that even within students or within the same higher education uh, institution, sometimes there isn't that sort of recognition or connection. So just to give one small example, during a focus group that we did for this research project, there were two student participants who were from the same university, who knew each other, who were friends, and they didn't actually know that the other one had participated in a 100,000 strong exchange program until they were in the focus group with us. And then they sort of looked over and were like, what are you doing here? Um, so we think that there's a huge potential to build that network um, and to connect students so that they know from the very beginning that they're joining this incredible group of alumni who have traveled across the hemisphere, who have really interesting and exciting um, careers and, and uh, you know, higher education experience and make them feel like that is another benefit of being involved in this program. Now, at the level of higher education institutions, um, 100,000 Strong does have an innovation network, um, but we think that this could be further strengthened to support collaboration, um, including post-grant cycle um, to really build a sustained community of practice around the 100,000 Strong program. That could be through theme-based meetings, through sharing project opportunities, um, or just creating that space for continued exchange. And, um, you know, for the, for the students, again, it's that chance to create a recognition about what it means to be a 100,000 strong student um, and to build peer affinity and relationships among that group that can continue 
uh, throughout that, those students' educational careers and professional lives. And um, I think this quote on the next slide really illustrates what that could mean from the, um, both the student perspective and the higher education perspective. Um, so from the student perspective, we see that they want uh, students to, students want to sort of know who's out there, who else is in 100,000 Strong, what does it mean to, to participate in this program, and who are the other actors. Um, and then from the higher education institution, um, to, to really sort of take advantage of the existing close working relationships that, that uh, higher education institutions have built through, through the grant application process and, and be able to extend those throughout the whole network. Um, so our third recommendation um, is sort of a, a parallel of that for donors um, and donor partners. So in the same way that it's really important to build shared networks and communal spaces, even if they're virtual spaces, for those higher education institutions and students, we believe that the same has to be true for the donor partners. Um, 100,000 Strong has done so much work already to identify and build a network of private and public sector actors who are really committed to higher education focused social action. And through by strengthening this network through events, through membership benefits, through other initiatives, we think that that could be a really smart way to foster new connections and collaboration opportunities, as well as bring in new sponsoring donor partners um, who are committed to this long term vision. And I think this quotation from a private sector donor partner um, really speaks to sort of how those, um, you know, actors feel that this could could be beneficial to their work. So another thing that became really clear to us during the research process, um, and which Anna mentioned as well um, in her presentation of the results, is that receiving multiple hundred thousand strong grants could make a huge difference in the sustainability of programs. And that was particularly true um, for higher education institutions that were either relatively small with, with limited uh, staff capacity or technical know-how for this sorts of program, or that didn't have a dedicated study abroad office. Um, and so we found through, through listening to the experiences um, of higher education institutions um, that offering multi-year grants or, or receiving you know, two grant cycles, um, even if it's just for those two years, could be the difference between a program continuing into the third year, even without receiving a grant or just not being able to continue. And so we know that that sustainability piece is so critical to the 100,000 strong mission. Um, and that's why we feel that sort of that really targeted um, multi-year funding cycles, particularly for those small um, higher education institutions could, could make a, an important difference. Um, and, and, and the final reason why we think that, that this is important is that it could be a really critical tool for um, improving or, or growing towards the diversity, equity, and inclusion objectives of the program. One thing that we heard from students and from universities is that word of mouth communication is a really important recruitment tool for this program. And so having students on campus who have been able to go through the program have returned and can speak to their peers about how incredible it was can make a really big difference in terms of uh, recruiting new students, but there has to be the program there that they can participate in and apply for. Um, and our final recommendation um, looks at sort of how to expand um, the 100K, 100,000 strong model into new areas. So it currently really primarily operates as an academic exchange model, although obviously within those exchanges, students are build, building really critical skills for their future professional endeavors. But we see an opportunity to expand that angle and make it more Explicit in terms of the workforce training and skills development opportunities that exist. And one way to do this would be through mentorship or intern programs with partner donors. Um, in our research, we did not find any evidence of current, part, uh, of current partner donors um, either hiring or offering internships to students that have participated in the program. 
but almost 70% of the survey respondents said that they would be interested in, some, in hiring or mentoring students who had come out of the program. So there's clearly interest, but there, it needs to be uh, sort of formalized into opportunities uh, for young people. Another way to do this is to um, expand eligibility cr criteria to include training institutions that may not be part of formal education systems or to create grant competitions that are explicitly tied to skills development initiatives. And here again, we see donor partners as really key collaborators um, in implementing this type of program, which will un undoubtedly require their active engagement in participant selection and theme specification. So to close, um, I think this quote from a private sector donor partner really captures what um, a 100,000 strong uh, program that's leveraging its current, um, you know, strengths and success and expanding into the future could could look like um, in terms of creating opportunities for for young people from throughout the Western Hemisphere. Um, so thank you so much um, to everyone for your time and attention. Um, as uh, was mentioned at the top of the program, um, if you have any questions about the presentation, um, please put them in the Q&A box and Anna and I will be able to respond to them there as best we can. Um, and the next part of our program is a really our all-star panel. Um, I couldn't be more excited for you all to hear from this extremely talented group. Um, this almost never happens, but every single person that we asked to be on this panel accepted. So we're super happy. This is truly a stellar group. Um, to moderate the panel, I am so pleased to introduce Roberta Jacobson, um, who has seen 100,000 strong from the very start. And so she brings tremendous knowledge of the program to this discussion. Um, in addition to being a member of the dialogue, uh, Roberta most recently served on the National Security Council under President Biden. Um, and oversaw U.S. Southern border policy. She was also the U.S. Ambassador to Mexico from 2016 to 2018 and the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs from 2012 to 2016. Um, and so in her uh, career as a civil servant, Roberta has focused on Latin America for more than 20 years and so brings uh, just a credible, an incredible amount of insight to this uh, panel moderation. So thank you so much and uh, over to you, Roberta. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Anna. Um, let me start off by saying that I appreciate the comment about spending 20 years on this. It's way more than 20 years, um, but I will take the compliment. Um, I am so excited to be here today, and it does not surprise me at all that everyone said yes. This is 100,000 Strong in the Americas is a program that we, uh, many of us who are uh, speaking today, are so proud to have been associated with. Um, I was present at their creation um, and was so proud to see it continue. Um, let me do two things uh, before we get underway. The first is to thank in particular some donors who have joined us today. And I wanna say starting out that um, I do not want to skip any donors. So if there are folks on the phone from 100K donors who are not mentioned in this list, my apologies in advance, but we're really thrilled to have representatives from Banorte, from the Jenkins Foundation, from Cementos Progreso, from Agroamerica, and from Chevron with us today, as well as obviously many members of our team uh, in the embassies in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, you've already heard inter brief introductions to our panelists, so I'm not going to give their long bios. They are extremely accomplished people. Uh, and that would take too much of our time. Uh, but we do have with us Guatemala's ambassador to the US, Alfonso Quinones, um, as well as being the current uh, Guatemalan ambassador to the US. Ambassador Quinones has a lengthy experience uh, in uh, the OAS and regional organizations. Um, we're thrilled to have Paula Enau, who is director of ICETEX in Colombia. Um, Colombia has been not only an area of recipient uh, grants that we're so pleased with and have been highly successful, but obviously a strong governmental supporter as well. Um, you've heard mention already of Aaron Gorink, who is the Diversity and Inclusion Services uh, Department Education Advocate 
at Fox Valley Technical College. Um, and we are so proud of their continued um, uh, work with 100,000 and continued work in bringing um, exchange programs to students who never thought that they would have that opportunity. Finally, we will also speak with Deputy Assistant Secretary John Pachowski uh, of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the State Department, who has a long and illustrious career. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing from him uh, about the impact of 100,000 Strong in the region. I'm going to make two more comments before we get underway with questions. The first is, I will go through our three panelists, not from the US government first on a couple of questions. Then I'm gonna pose a final question to John. My apologies that the timing is so tight, we won't have time to take all of your questions um, in the oral fashion, but we'll try and answer all of them one way or another. Um, the second thing is I'm going to have to beg the indulgence of our panelists to keep your answers short. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time and uh, we know that there's a lot to talk about and your enthusiasm uh, will be represented here. I'd like to start by asking our panelists in turn, um, what was your experience with 100,000 Strong Innovation Fund? Um, how uh, did this go for you? How, what was the impact? Um, so how can you convey to us a little bit the importance of it? Um, if I could start with Ambassador Quinones. Uh, thank you very much, Roberta, and thank you very much for um, dialogue and, and, and the, the members of the initiative for having invited me. Um, this is very dear to me, and, and, and I would divide my experience into two levels. Uh, obviously, one as Ambassador of Guatemala and a country that has benefited from, uh, from the fund, but also an ex as a former executive of a company uh, in Guatemala that believed in the program. Uh, that saw the great potential uh, uh, and he was willing to support it. Uh, the company is Cementos Progreso, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, Roberta, in your introduction, is one of the donors and, and was the first one in Guatemala. And I believe that also was the first one in Central America that, that contributed to the fund. I'm, I'm very happy to see now that Cementos Progreso is not the only one. Uh, another company from Guatemala, Agroamerica, has joined the effort and it's, uh, that is very encouraging. And I hope that more companies would uh, 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 support the, the, the initiative. Uh, but you know, when you were uh, uh, talking, I, I I I remember something, and I and I should have said that uh, uh, my experience is in three levels because uh, I was working at the OAS as the head of the external relations and also responsible for the Summit of the Americas when this initiative was launched. Uh, and one of the issues that I always advocated while at the OAS was the importance of this cultural and academic exchange between peoples um, uh, of the United States and and Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, one of which not just uh, um, uh, that my fellow Latin Americans would come to the United States in, through scholarships, but one in which also Americans would go to the region and engage there, uh, have the feel uh, of the region, but not just uh, through textbooks or, or, or documentaries, but actual interaction uh, with the people uh, and with the, uh, with the land. Uh, as ambassador, obviously, I'm extremely pleased that Guatemala and Guatemalan higher education institutions had been very active and had participated um, in the fund. Uh, by having had this benefit, obviously, the students, the faculty benefit, uh, but also the country, uh, because there is a spill, there is a cascade of, of, of the knowledge acquired in this and the experiences that they, uh, that they have had. Of course, I would love to see more institutions and more students from Guatemala participating, but that will not happen unless there is more participation of donors. And, and, and that gets me to my third experience as an advocate within uh, the company Cementos Progreso uh, to make the contribution happen. I have to say that it did not took much effort uh, because Progreso is a company that is forward looking and, and very committed uh, to foster capacity building at every level in, um, uh, in Guatemala. I remember vividly uh, when I met with uh, Maggie and, and Ukaya uh, in the company's headquarters in Guatemala and the discussion we had. Uh, I also remember, and, and Maggie and Ukaya would remember this, uh, the event we had at the US Embassy where everybody wore our hard hats uh, and we're celebrating the alliance. But really perhaps the moment that, uh, that uh, everything came full, full circle uh, 
uh, for me was my conversation with a young student from Honduras. Um, he was studying at the Escuela Zamorano de Agricultura, and, and he was studying there uh, with a, a scholarship. He came from a rural area and from a very poor family, had never been outside his country, and there was he in Guatemala interacting with a U.S. Uh, university. I think it was from the Midwest. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if uh, Aaron if was Wisconsin or not, but, but anyhow, um, he was so enthusiastic. He was so focused and so committed. And, and, and in a way, um, I, I saw on him uh, 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 the personification of, of, of these words uh, that President Obama uh, said when, when launching the, uh, the, the, the initiative. And I quote, uh, President Obama said, because when we study together and learn together, we work together and we prosper together. So I think that that captures very well the spirit and, and, and I would leave it there, uh, Roberta, um, uh, for sake of, uh, sake of time. Thank you, Ambassador, that's terrific. I appreciate that. Um, let me ask Paula now the same question. Um, what, what has been your and Colombia's experience with 100,000 Strong? Well, thank you, Roberta. Hi to everyone. Hola, buenas tardes a todos en el hemisferio. Well, I have been involved with, with this program for over seven years. I had the opportunity to become a part of it while I was working with a higher education institution in the region located in the coffee area in my country. And I remember at the moment, it was more like, is this possible? Can we do it? Can we really do it? So we were looking for partners. And so it became a dream to be part of the program. Uh, later on, I joined another institution, government institution that was called Conciencias, the Ministry of, of Science, Innovation and Technology. And from there, uh, we took also the opportunity to work together in a program called Nexo Global. And then uh, with ISATEX, where I'm working right now. So I have had the chance to work, like you see the different perspectives from the region. What is it that the universities here need? How hard was for them to realize that this was possible, that we could do it. It was more like, like this, this hope that they could become part part of this great alliance and then now seven years later uh we were trying to recall all of the experiences and seeing the impact it has had not only in the higher education institutions in the donors but also the students finally that's why we are doing it so uh, believing that students can really be part of a program like this that they, their lives change not only their lives but also their families their surroundings their mentality so this wouldn't be possible without the help of all of these institutions that come together, the Department of State, the embassies in both countries, both in Colombia and in the United States, of course, Diana being part of that, uh, Ukaya from, uh, from Partners, Maggie, you know, from, from the Department of State, and Paula from ISATEX, my other Paula. So all of them working together so hard in order to make this come true. So the impact, uh, we have seen it with different projects that have evolved from that first moment in Colombia, now to becoming mm, and being part of this. We just announced the final round last week, more than 77 proposals we received, uh, or we, they were complete and they were so good, all of them. And so it was inevitable to recall that first moment when all of us being part of the institutions were like, hmm, is this going to be sustainable? Is this something we can dream of in the future? Well, now we see that this is part of what we work together from uh, both the, the universities and the government and the private sector. That's terrific, Paula, we really appreciate that. And I think just to, to transition a little bit, hearing from uh, representatives of governments and government institutions in countries that have been leaders in this program, I hope uh, will stimulate other countries, other institutions to follow suit and to recognize that um, in the words of one previous US president, yes, we can. Um, so, so we're really um, excited about the broadening to Central America and the leadership that Colombia has taken over the years. Let me ask Aaron Goring if you can talk with us a little bit about the impact uh, and the experience you've had with 100K, a very different institution in a technical um, uh, college, um, and you have been so successful. Tell us what this has uh, meant and your own experience with it. 
All right, wonderful. Thank you, Ambassador Jacobson, for moderating the panel and everybody else uh, on the on the virtual call today. Um, I do have a, a bit of a different experience, and I'm trying to gather three kind of experiences into one large experience um, when it comes to the 100,000 Strong Initiative. So yes, we are um, a two-year technical college in the state of Wisconsin, one of 16 technical colleges in the state. And we serve about 50,000 people annually in our associate degree, technical diploma, short-term certificate programs. So our student body, as you would imagine, is quite wide in range of age and, and, and uh, working individuals, their are student parents, and, and you know, so everything in between, so quite diverse uh, to begin with. We, um, interestingly enough, the, the conversation of workforce development, we've been providing workforce development training for 110 years now, so it's sort of at our core, and the mission is to provide relevant technical education and training to support student goals, a skilled workforce, and then economic vitality of our communities. And this really hasn't changed over our, our you know, over 100 years of, of, of work. We as an institution began providing international experiences in the Western Hemisphere as early as 2004, as far as our records are concerned, um, which included consistent travel to Mexico through 2008 until another pesty pandemic canceled our immersion programs in Mexico in 2009. And in fact, we haven't traveled back to Mexico since then. We have, however, provided opportunities to Jamaica, Costa Rica, and Peru, what I guess you can call relatively, quote unquote, safe destinations when it comes to the study abroad conversation. It really wasn't until the announcement of the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Fund when we began looking for or really started thinking about partnership opportunities with institutions in other parts of the Western Hemisphere. And I'll have to be honest, overall fit and program alignment was really important for us to proceed with writing and submitting a grant. And when competition eight, specifically for community colleges in the US and SENA in Colombia was announced, we knew an opportunity was knocking. However, had it not been for Partners of the Americas and the partnership building mission to Colombia in 2016, we would have not been able to find and secure a partner to submit a grant to begin with. I had the opportunity to participate in the partnership building mission. And it was there that I met with our winning partner from Sina Fluke, a SENA center in Cartagena. When mission and visions align and the determination for student success is evident, a grant was ultimately selected as a winner. The grant itself provided travel stipends for five Fox Valley Tech students and six SENA students to participate in a bi-directional, credit-bearing, short-term faculty-led program which included academic training and entrepreneurship, cross-cultural understanding, and of course, second language learning and practice. This program and these students would have otherwise never been able to, or believe they even could participate in an international mobility experience. A similar story can be told about our winning grants with UBA in Argentina and UPG in Guanajuato, Mexico. The grant announcements truly aligned with our interests and quite honestly, our exper expertise, capitalizing off of that success that we had with our program in Colombia, a winning grant with the Faculty of Agriculture at the University of Buenos Aires brought existing business entrepreneurs who also were students and provided business development training and um, business model design training. Again, had it not been for these specific grant programs, we simply would not have had the opportunity to find, create, and build partnerships in Colombia and Argentina. And our most recent winning grant with the Universidad Politecnico de Guanajuato will provide our jump start for student mobility. As an existing partner, thanks once again to partners and their innovation network, uh, UPG had been able to send faculty and leaders in the past, but we always wanted student mobility to follow. And as you would imagine, had it not been for the Innovation Fund grant, students at UPG likely would have never traveled on a personal and professional development program to the US. Similarly can be said about FETC students traveling to Mexico and hopefully we'll be able to get to it as soon as it's safe to do so. So for us as the two-year technical college, the 100,000 strong program is visibility, the impact on our students, our campus community, and the community at large has been seen and felt all over the place. But the success of our student remains paramount. The power of these mobility program, these mobility opportunities really gives our students a tremendous boost against the competition all around the world now and have our local employers wanting more and more of our graduates. 
So I'll leave it at that as well. That is particularly exciting, Aaron. Thank you so much for that. And I think that, you know, especially as we look at the final recommendation of, um, of the dialogue study, which talks about the engagement with employers, the possibility for mentoring or internships, what you're talking about is of course the ultimate goal of all these education programs. Yes, we want them to improve understanding. Yes, we want them to improve cultural dialogue. But for so many of our students, what we want is for them to get improved access to good, well-paying jobs that can support them and their families in the future and give them that leg up that we know international education can do. Thanks so much for that. Um, let me turn to the second round and I'm going to shake up the order a little bit so you can't know when I'm gonna come to you. Uh, the second question I would love you all to engage in is how we can improve 100,000 strong in the future. Yes, we have the dialogue report, but each of you have your own experiences with this and can help us not only in our big picture vision of how 100K can be a better program for everybody, but also any additional specific recommendations, one or two things you think would really help uh, in the future that maybe are not in the report today. Um, so if I could, I'm gonna start with Paula um, and ask you what you might think of as improvements. I will say that I was gonna talk a little bit about the impact of 100K, but you've all really covered that in your first question. So let's talk a little bit about the future and how it can be the best program for recipients and participants. Thanks, Paula. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, I, we've been thinking about that, how to make it sustainable uh, in Colombia so that more and more students benefit from a program like this as resources are limited. So of course, when we're talking about mobility, when we have a pandemic in, in our backyards, uh, when we have to face all of these kind of challenges um, and this, these programs survive all of that. So last year, when we were going to, when we launched the program, actually, we were thinking about it is like we cannot move we have to stay in our countries so that represents a, a, not a minor but a major challenge uh, for the whole program so if the program were not uh, strong enough well of course it would have disappeared you know but it didn't happen Instead, we found from Colombia the, the possibility of strengthening uh, internationalization, not only based on mobility, but also in some other kinds. So I think it was an opportunity to really come and understand what our uh, strengths were, because the, 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 of course the, the challenge was there. How do we improve this in the future? I have uh, been thinking about the other proposals, the ones that were not chosen, but they were very, very good. How do we collect them? How do we take a look at them and see what kind of different opportunities we can offer these proposals? I know from Colombia, different universities, for example, Minuto de Dios, Tadeo, some of them have already developed a skill uh, in these kind of proposals. They are winners, but they have also presented some others that didn't get the funding. It would be very nice if we could take a look at them and see how is it that they evolved or not, and how we can participate from the governmental part of it or the higher education institutions. And of course, the network. It is a very valuable thing. Of course, you can rank according to desires and intentions from the government point of view, but the, the, the network for us is really important. I would love to see this not only bilateral, meaning Colombia, United States, but how can we open this in the hemisphere so that we can take advantage, advantage of it. I have to say this again, Roberta, seven years ago, we weren't sure that we were going to make this happening, happen between the two countries. Let's think about the hemisphere. How can the United States become this, of course, leader in helping us, the rest of the region, come together? And so, because you already have all of the assets, you have the information, you have the capabilities. And so I'm dreaming of a more um, comprehensive network. That's great, Paula, really important. Um, and I wanna pick up on one of those themes a little bit later. Um, but let me turn to Ambassador Quinones and ask you, um, you know, both from your governmental, multilateral, um, and frankly, your, your private sector experience, how, how can we 
Are there ways that we can adjust, improve uh, 100K uh, so that you feel it would be even more successful in Guatemala or in the region? Uh, thank you, Roberta, for the for the question. And, and, and I would start for, uh, by com commending Sarah and Anna uh, for their uh, analysis, uh, uh, which I fully agree on, on, on the, the conclusions that, the, that they reached. Um, I would love to see more exchanges between Guatemala and Central American universities with U.S. universities. But we know that that is contingent upon many factors. And, and one of those, which is key, is the resources. So I think that a special efforts should be made to continue recruiting more private sector um, uh, uh, contributions like the one Cementos Progreso has done or like the one Agroamerica um, uh, have done, has done uh, uh, both from Guatemala. Um, I think that it's also important uh, to keep the contacts or foster contacts um, uh, through the U.S. embassies in, 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 our, in, in our country. That, that, that would really, really um, uh, make, a, make a difference. Uh, regarding the private sector, I, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Sarah and Anna indicated in, in their evaluation in terms of the motivations by the private sector to contribute. Uh, on the one hand, we have the, the, the corporate social responsibility and sustainability programs and how they get to be aligned, but also how the topics uh, that are going to be dealt in these interchanges uh, are focused or are aligned with the core business of, of the company. So, so I think that, that there has to be a, a correlation there. Uh, so to uh, uh, create more enthusiasm uh, by all the, the, the participants. I would add another one, uh, which I, I, I think is very important that has to do with the recognition to donors. And I know that, that, this, that this happens, but I think it's important to stress and, 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 and not just putting it in, in, um, in the webpage or, 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 or in the flyers or the communications. Um, I, I, I have to share with you that the experience we had when I worked for Cementos Progreso and we visited at the State Department and had the opportunity to interact with the Assistant Secretary of State uh, at the time when we joined the, the, the initiative uh, was, was, was excellent. Uh, or also, and I remember this very vividly, and, and I don't know if uh, uh, Das uh, Piechowski remember this, but I remember him in his speech recognizing Cementos Progreso. That was an, an event at the Bush Center uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. And this went a, a really a long way. Uh, Additionally, I think that there, there is need for promoting more interactions between um, uh, the donors and the, and the students, the faculty and the universities, uh, but not just from the, the universities, the local universities, but also the US-based uh, universities with, uh, uh, with the companies. And, 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 and also look into the possibility of exploring uh, internships um, uh, in, those, uh, in, those, in those companies and perhaps just thinking out loud, uh, when the U.S. companies are visiting the countries, perhaps the companies that have been supporting the program can invite uh, the, those uh, uh, universities to visit uh, their plants or their or the companies to to get the the the, the experience of, of of the company that uh, has been promoting uh, or has been contributing to the uh, to the effort. Another element uh, which I think it's, it's important is, is how to foster even more lasting connections uh, among the, the universities that, that participated. This may be even uh, uh, promote greater academic mobility uh, after, after the program has, uh, has finished. And in my mind at the beginning, I, 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 I focus a lot on the benefits to the students that participated in the program. But, but I think it's also important to focus on the faculty uh, because, uh, because they can create a ripple effect, a cascade effect, because they, they, they will be teaching other students, not just the ones that are part of the, part of the problem. And, and this could also create uh, more faculty interactions and, and the possibility of further uh, research, uh, research co collaborations. And, and just to, to close, when, when I was, um, I have to confess that I, that I prepare for, for, for this uh, presentation. Um, uh, and, and when doing some research, I, I, it came I came across some um, uh, uh, statement made by then Vice President Biden uh, when referring to the initiative. And I think it, it is very, very um, uh, uh, key to mention it, uh, mention it here. And I, and I quote, and with this I finished, Roberta, uh, and, and he said, the more exposed we are to each other's culture, 
more fluent we are in each other's language, more knowledgeable about each other's economies and societies is what in fact is going to build this incredible alliance in the hemisphere. So I would close with that. Thank you, Roberta. That's really terrific. And, and thank you in particular, Ambassador Quinones for reminding us uh, of the, the comments made by leaders, uh, one in particular who is quite important now, um, uh, the comments that, that of their commitment to this and, and why we're, we're doing this in the first place. I wanna highlight two things that have been said uh, for follow-up um, because uh, you never have, uh, there's, there's no, uh, no reward for success, uh, but more work. Um, and that is, I think, Paula's comment about proposals that don't win and, and whether there are ways that governments or private sector or educational institutions themselves can take advantage of some very high quality proposals um, in their own work. When they're looking at who they may fund, are there ways to collaborate so that the, if you will, the runners up have other opportunities to, to create those partnerships. And the second I would mention is exactly what Ambassador Quinone said about the interactions between participant institutions and the private sector donors. Um, I think it does remind us of the importance of having that database as the report recommends so that alumni and institutions can be followed up, can be tracked in the future. Um, let me close out this round, once again, turning to Aaron uh, to give us his perspective on things that could be improved. Uh, I will say that one theme that has run through all of this is funding, funding streams, increasing funding, um, lengthening times or repeating uh, the, the year long grants. Um, and we know, I think from all of our experience that continuing to work to find the companies like Cementos Progreso, Agroamerica, Chevron, uh, by Norte, Fun Jenkins Foundation, and others, finding even more of those who can benefit from these experiences is, is crucial. Um, so let me turn to you, Aaron, for your perspective on any changes or adjustments that would help. Great. Thank you, Ambassador Jacobson. I also want to echo what Ambassador Quinone says and, and the work that has already been done and the recommendations, which I also um, would agree with, um, with, with all of them. I, I do want to point out um, the, 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 the comment about the, the, the losing. So on one hand, I had the opportunity to win some as well, but, I, but I've also lost some of these 100,000 strong grants. Um, and again, knowing that they were strong in their own right and there was just other institutions who were stronger, totally great. What I, what I would also like to see, we talked about any mentorship or intern for students, to offer almost an institutional mentorship, talk how, how allow these runner-ups or really close um, proposals to perhaps speak with or work with some of the winning institutions to tweak, you know, just to guide and help them along so they don't um, waste is not the right word, but as we heard, there's a lot of work around campus that needs to be done with different departments and individuals and the team collaboration really gets everybody super excited and if it's not selected what happens well, hopefully that excitement for us in global education the curiosity needs to stay high or it sometimes can be forgotten so a mentorship type opportunity between institutions whether they're domestic or international in my opinion it wouldn't really matter in fact i would appreciate mentorship from international institutions to help us develop the partnerships better for sustainability. So that's definitely one thing for perhaps providing some mentorship opportunities for institutions. Um, and highlighting even more so this idea of workforce development or employability, right? Um, I think the institutions both in the US and abroad have a similar goal of, of engaging our students to be to get hired, to get paid, to provide some economic vitality for their local communities or for their country. And I think we all have that same mission and purpose, but it may not be as explicit as perhaps ours is at Fox Valley Technical College. And if these grants 
at the end of the day are interested in our students growing personally and professionally to be able to work and communicate in this global economy that we've all talked about, um, regardless of program area, regardless of um, increased diversity in student body, that really at the end of the day, we need sustainable employment, right? And, and employees through the pipeline, through education, um, technical education and academic education, and to be perhaps more explicit if indeed that's what we're looking for. Those would be maybe my two recommendations uh, without taking too much time. Well, you've all been terrifically disciplined in your responses and I appreciate that. Um, but I think uh, Aaron's raised some really important points moving forward. I guess I would hope personally um, that no one considers it crass um, or outside our mission to be focused on um, you know, workforce development, employability, what comes next. Um, we all think these programs do, do uh, a million things and they affect our students and our, our institutions in different ways. Um, but you're absolutely right that when and if we can show that connection to becoming employed, following their dream uh, in a very practical way, uh, I think we, we lift up the program and its, its goals. Um, thank you all to our panelists. That was really wonderful. I wanna turn now to someone who's been super, super patient um, and is a big part of the efforts on 100,000 Strong in the America, the Deputy Assistant Secretary in, I think he's currently acting Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in WHA at the State Department, John Pachowski. Um, John, I want to ask you if you could help us understand how 100,000 Strong in the Americas fits with the policy goals of WHA, how it advances them, and where you see that nexus. Um, because this is where you do your work uh, in, the, in the public diplomacy, um, education, cultural exchange, and, and other programs, and how they both impact policy and are impacted by policy. Well, thank you very much for the uh, question, Ambassador Jacobson. And uh, I mean, thank you again to the dialogue, uh, the quality of the report. Uh, I think the specificity of the recommendations are such that uh, you've given me a lot of food for thought and, and I think some actionable ideas. And uh, I think the, the, the same can be said for uh, what I have been listening to uh, during the, the conversation just now. Um, you know, I think uh, as we talk about what the uh, Bureau of Western Hemisphere uh, envisions uh, for uh, the US government's relations with countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, and how 100,000 strong uh, in the America's Innovation Fund ties into that, uh, you know, we are looking uh, to build um, uh, relations uh, of greater prosperity, both for American workers, American businesses, uh, as well as for our partners uh, overseas. Uh, we're looking to strengthen uh, democratic governance, uh, and we're looking for greater uh, citizen security um, through strengthened rule of law. Um, and better institutions. And when you think about what we're talking about through 100,000 Strong, the, uh, the competition rounds, the partnerships that we forge really feed into it, whether it is looking at some of uh, the rounds that the Jenkins uh, Foundation and Banorte have sponsored in Mexico um, with uh, Mexican students, uh, to uh, what Cementos Progreso has done um, for some of the Central American rounds. You know, as we, as we think a lot about countries of Central America, um, having uh, populations who are equipped to uh, really build greater prosperity in their communities, to answer the challenges and the demands that their neighbors have, uh, you know, education can, can speak to a lot of it. Um, you know, I would also look though to, to uh, the recent round uh, that we, we sponsored uh, in Colombia and, you know, diversity of the American institutions, preponderance of historically black colleges and universities, uh, presence of uh, pr predominantly Hispanic serving institutions. Um, and then when you look at their partners in Colombia, it is not just in the capital. We are partnering with institutions throughout the country 
uh, through the Valle del Cauca, looking at places that have been affected by uh, conflict as Colombians are trying to build um, a brighter future in areas that maybe had suffered more. Uh, here is 100,000 strong and it's able to, to reach new generations uh, and reach people who hadn't had the opportunity uh, in the past to, um, to attend higher education, whether it's a, a four year institution or, or whether it's uh, akin to a, a technical school, to a community college or uh, to uh, a two year program. So, you know, frankly, to me, as I'm thinking about what everybody is, has said and what I'm saying, uh, I'm really just uh, struck by in the seven years, the flexibility of this program to partner with governments uh, in some areas where uh, our partner nations have a very active ministry of, of education or higher education to other places where maybe the private sector has a, uh, a greater role. And we can um, adjust uh, accordingly. Um, as we look to the future, uh, WHA Bureau is really looking um, back to uh, South America, uh, to some regions where we haven't been as, as active in the most recent years, such as in the Andes. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see uh, some interesting partnerships uh, forged from that. But uh, ultimately, whether a school uh, competes and receives a grant or they compete and they don't, uh, we're building a, a, a network we're uh, challenging uh, notions that you cannot do uh, study abroad or international programs, and uh, that benefits everybody. So um, uh, I'm a diplomat, so of course uh, I took a, a long time to answer uh, Ambassador Jacobson's uh, pretty simple question, but we're so excited and uh, I, I'm really happy by uh, the participation and the, the insights that have uh, been exchanged today. Thanks, John. That's enormously helpful. And, um, and I will say that um, as critical um, as our private sector partners are in all of this, um, I do think, and I, I hope you will agree, um, that the role of the State Department and the U.S. government has been both, um, you know, the, the one of the most important reasons that others donate um, it gives it an imprimatur that, that really can't be beat. Um, and that the, this, this P3 model uh, that we have in the 100,000 Strong in the Americas will continue to get the support of the U.S. government via the State Department. Um, I won't put you on the spot to say yes or no, but I hope you will at least uh, make, uh, make positive noises in that direction. I, I make noises. Um, I think you all of you saw today uh, through uh, Acting Assistant Secretary uh, Chung's participation. She makes noises. Um, you know, we uh, the, the 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 Secretary of State was just in in Costa Rica. Uh, Vice President Harris was in uh, Guatemala and Mexico. And uh, I know through some of their interactions uh, that there were. Um, alumni or, or others who, who have a 100,000 strong affiliation. So we think it's, uh, it's vital uh, that uh, State Department money uh, continues to go toward that. And uh, is, I, I think our ability to, to garner further financing uh, becomes a lot easier through the success that the program has had from our uh, partner nations, partner governments, uh, through the higher ed institutions uh, as well as with a private sector partner. So we're- Thank we're you so much. Time. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate that. And we are so grateful for the champions that we have uh, in WHA and in the State Department at every level. Um, I wanna take uh, the prerogatives I have to just close out really quickly um, with a couple of comments. First of all, um, I was indeed sort of present at the birth of this initiative and it, it took a little time to get off the ground. Um, and there were times when we too, as Paula said, thought it was a dream that might never actually happen. Um, but one of the challenges we had at the very beginning was the model, the model not to fund individual student scholarships, but instead to focus on institution to institution arrangements. Uh, as a way of increasing the amount of individual student exchange. 
I will also say, and, and our government panelists from the US know this, that one of the things that drives US government funding um, is, is metrics, right? We always need metrics. We need to be able to prove, we knew this makes a difference anecdotally, all of us champions. The Inter-American Dialogues report today is an enormous help in being able to do that with our potential donors, including the US government, um, as well as policymakers. And so we're really grateful because we may have known that this program was succeeding, but we now have the metrics that help us prove that as well as recommendations for further uh, improvement. The second thing I wanna say is that one of the key things for me when I was an assistant, was assistant secretary as this began was making sure that we did not engage only the students who probably would have gone on exchange programs anyway. Um, we wanted to get to those students who never thought they would be part of international exchange programs for socioeconomic reasons, for reasons of family and responsibility and jobs. Um, and I think that that is the other thing that the study shows us today and of which we can be very proud. And this has given me great joy to know that things are continuing. Um, I thank all of our panelists uh, so much for your uh, participation. Um, and one final shout out uh, to Maggie Hug, who is in so many ways been the heart and soul of this project. I know there are probably 100,000 people in the Americas who have been part of the success and the advance of this program. Um, but we all know how tenacious Maggie has been in making all of this happen. I'd like to now turn it over to John McPhail from the president and CEO of the Partnership of the Americas and one of the greatest um, organizations to make this uh, project and adventure happen. And thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I'll turn it over to John, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Jacobson. Uh, that was a fantastic discussion and your moderation skills are exemplary. You know, when I first joined Partners of the Americas and was introduced to the 100,000 Strong in the Americas Innovation Fund, I was both excited and inspired by what we were doing. And now four years later, after listening to this fantastic panel uh, and reading the results of the report, I'm still very much inspired and even more excited to continue supporting the transformational work. I'd like to take just a couple minutes to give some thanks and then share a few thoughts in closing. Uh, so once again, Ambassador Jacobson, thank you for your time with us today. And as we reflect on the impact and reach of the 100K Innovation Fund, which as you have mentioned and others that you've supported during your tenure as ambassador to Mexico, and before that in your leadership position at WHA in the State Department. John Pachowski, my team and I at Partners of the Americas are deeply grateful for the trust and partnership that we've developed over the past seven years, collaborating with your team at WHA and with the US embassies throughout the region who do so much to support the 100K partnerships. Ambassador Quinones, we want to also recognize your leadership and vision to invest in the Innovation Fund from your previous position at Cementos Progreso, which helped to secure Guatemala's place as the leading country in Central America in terms of private sector partnerships with the Innovation Fund and in terms of a uh, number of grants uh, from winning universities. Paula, also thanks to you and commitments from ESATEX. Uh, thanks to all that, your teams have brought life-changing opportunities to students in Colombia and the United States. Thanks to the generosity of ESATEX and other Colombian education agencies Columbia ranks second in this hemispheric initiative. Aaron, 100K depends on the hard work, the creativity, the determination and dedication of faculty and staff like you at colleges and universities throughout the US and Latin America. You and other program leaders are on the ground every day. You're working to provide new and better opportunities for your students to develop the 21st century skills needed to be successful in today's workforce and to advance our economies and communities. So thank you and your team for your tireless efforts to create new exchange opportunities for students in Argentina, Mexico, and Colombia. And I'd also like to thank Michael, Ariel, Sarah, Anna, and the entire Dialogue team 
for your commitment and diligence in developing this comprehensive report to help us measure and reflect on the impact of the innovation fund model on regional education exchanges and public private partnerships. Your work speaks for itself, of course, but we have been very impressed with the analytic rigor and the subject matter expertise that you contributed. And last but not least, and my team didn't ask me to say this, I'd like to thank them for all their hard work, Ukiah, Penelope, Laura, and others on our team. And of course, with the support of Maggie Hug from the State Department, you are all rock stars. So partners mission is to connect people and organizations across and within borders to serve and change lives. And I think that among all of the programs we implement across the hemisphere, none better embodies that mission than the 100,000 strong in the America's Innovation Fund. So this program is all about working in partnership to create positive change. And it's only through strategic public-private partnerships that the Innovation Fund is able to then invest in partnerships between universities and colleges in the US and Latin America and the Caribbean. Since the very earliest days of the initiative, Partners of the Americas has been proud to work hand in hand with the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs at the State Department and with embassies throughout the region to forge these public-private partnerships, carry out the Innovation Fund grant competitions, monitor the implementation of the exchange and training programs, and ensure that more students, and especially those from diverse and underserved communities, are able to access innovative, impactful, international learning opportunities in the Americas. Now, I was very touched by a quote cited in the Dialogues report, which was uh, shared earlier during the presentation on the report today, and I think it's worth repeating. It comes from an interview with a uh, 100K student beneficiary from a small rural Pueblo in Latin America. And she said, quote, with this type of program, we become like lanterns. When I had the opportunity to study in the United States, I became a local phenomenon at my university and in my community. And people would come up to me and they would ask, how did you do it? And you realize that you can share your light with others and motivate the people around you so that they see that it is not impossible, that you don't need to be special. We all have the capacity and the skills to do it, end quote. Empowerment is contagious. And it's exactly this type of impact the Partners of the Americas is so proud to play a central role in implementing this initiative. And as we've seen today, this has only grown in size and relevance it was, uh, since it was officially launched back in January 2014. From an unfunded presidential mandate, the Innovation Fund has flourished across three U.S. administrations, implementing 30 grant competitions in seven years and awarding 253 grants to 504 higher education institutions working in teams across 25 countries in 49 US states and territories. I think perhaps even more impressive is the level to which it leverages investments almost equally from the US Department of State, which has generously contributed $7 million, and then from the private sector and other nations' governments, which together have contributed $7.2 million, and from the universities and colleges themselves, which to date have contributed almost $8.5 million in cash and in-kind resources. This critical investment of time and money across government, business, and academic sectors is such a powerful illustration of the shared conviction that education and regional collaboration are the keys to improving lives and livelihoods, as well as our country's international relations and economies in the 21st century. And we're all in this together. The impact evaluation published today by the Inter-American Dialogue I think it validates once again the power and impact of the unique public-private model that underpins the Innovation Fund, and offering further proof of concept for this innovative approach to expanding higher education collaboration and student mobility and training between the colleges and universities in the U.S. and those in Latin American and Caribbean. Of the report's many positive findings, I'd like to highlight uh, a couple here. First, um, and I quote, 100K funded programs in the last seven years have undoubtedly have a lasting catalytic impact on the academic and professional development, as well as the future trajectories of participating students, enabling students in the US and LAC to advance, launch, 
or transform their academic and professional trajectories while planting a seed for lasting collaborative networks across the hemisphere, end quote. As we've seen repeatedly confirmed by study after study, and again today, these Innovation Fund international training programs are transformative for the students who participate. And this brings me to the second highlight from the study that, I, uh, that focuses precisely on who gets to participate. And I quote here, 100K student cohorts are consistently more diverse than the overall student population in their institutions and other US-based academic exchange programs. Notably, surveyed US HEIs report that their 100K cohorts include racial minority students at a rate that is 52 percentage points higher than US average study abroad programs, end quote. This further verifies that the Innovative Fund is working exactly as intended, creating more opportunities for a more diverse set of students at more institutions in more fields of study. Uh, you know, we're deeply pleased to receive this validation and look forward to continuing to work with WHA and our partners in the region to improve and expand this initiative. Looking forward, I think there's a lot to be excited about in 2021. And we are committed to working closely with WHA, the US embassies, leaders from the private sector and regional governments and the higher education communities in the Americas to ensure we continue to offer grant opportunities and expand access to innovative education and training programs through this impactful program. In fact, we look forward to launching up to three new grant competitions this year, to support new international exchange and training programs between universities in the US in the WHA priority countries of Brazil, Chile, and the Andean region countries. I'm also excited to share that the Innovation Fund has recently been shortlisted as a semi-finalist for the 2021 Concordia P3 Impact Award. It's a prestigious competition that recognizes and honors leading public-private partnerships that improve communities around the world. We're delighted and honored to have advanced to the top 10 candidates and look forward to the results. I think in short, 100K is going strong in 2021 and it will continue to do so for years. So I'd like to close uh, by again, thanking the Inter-American Dialogue and our panelists and everyone joining us virtually today. And by sharing a few words from then Vice President Joe Biden, when he officially launched the 100K Innovation Fund in January, 2020, 2014, where you Ambassador Jacobson presided. In that speech, Vice President Biden said, 100,000 strong isn't just another US program, uh, but on government scholarship program. What we're trying to do here is create something more. We're trying to create a synergy, a new synergy between private sector, charities, universities, and all the governments of the hemisphere to invest in sending students to and from the United States to lower the financial, logistical, language, and informational barriers that now stand in the way. 100,000 students going to Latin America and the Caribbean and 100,000 students from the hemisphere coming here. This is the stuff of which close ties are made. This is the stuff of which economic growth is cemented. Partners of the Americas, WHA, the region's embassies, and all of our partners in the public and private sectors have together carried that vision forward for the last seven years. Today's validation from the dialogue's evaluation will fuel and inform our work in the years to come. Thank you all again for coming to today's event and for the unique contributions you have each made to this initiative. Buenas tardes a todos y muchas gracias. Thank you so much, John. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to the wonderful team at Partners of the Americas and the State Department. Um, and most importantly, thank you uh, to all of the um, uh, donor partners, students, and um, higher education institution professionals who spoke with us and responded to our surveys to make this um, report possible. Um, we're, we're super grateful to them. Um, as has been mentioned several times before, um, the report is available on our website now and um, in the coming days we'll have an event summary 
of this event, which will include the recording um, as well as the uh, PowerPoint uh, that we shared, um, and that will be available on our website. So on behalf of the Inter-American Dialogue, um, thanks again to everyone for joining us. Uh, very pleased uh, to have you with us today. Thanks.